Hello and welcome to another episode of the 1020 podcast. Today I'll be talking to Dr. Barry Strauss about his newest book on the war that made the Roman Empire. Barry S. Strauss is a historian and professor of history and classics at Cornell University. He is an expert on ancient military history and has written numerous books, including The Battle of Salamis in 2004, The Trojan War in 2006, The Spartacus War in 2009, Masters of Command in 2013, and my personal favorite so far, The Death of Caesar in 2015. His books have been translated into over 16 languages. His most recent book is The War That Made the Roman Empire, the conflict between Octavian, Mark Antony, and Cleopatra. Professor Strauss, however, is not only a prolific writer, he's also a commentator on on contemporary issues from modern leadership to politics, and he publishes regularly in magazines like The New Criterion, The Wall Street Journal, and others. He's also a podcaster himself, and his podcast, Antiquitas, can be found on his personal homepage at www.barrystrauss.com. I highly encourage my listeners to take a look because engaging with Professor Strauss' work is both educational and due to his engaging writing style, entertaining and capturing. He's also a contributor to the Netflix original series, Roman Empire, which I also highly recommend. Professor Strauss, welcome to the 1020 podcast. My first question is, why would you write a book about the Battle of Actium? In your book, you argue that the world history might have taken a different direction if that battle would have ended differently. Maybe you could explore a little bit on this potential alternative history. So, okay, because the battle went the way that it did, uh, Rome remained the center of the uh, Roman Empire, and the uh, the center of gravity of the Roman Empire was towards the west. Uh, Antony had been uh, the triumvir in charge of the Roman East, and I think Octavian almost uh, by magnetic attraction or uh, the opposite of magnetic attraction found himself going to the West. Had the battle gone the other way, it would have been quite the opposite. Alexandria would have emerged as de facto, if not de jure, the second capital of Rome. It would have been a Constantinople before Constantinople. Uh, Antony would have gone back to what had been his his main idea before the war with, um, with Octavian, which was to fight the Parthian Empire and to conquer at least a part of the Parthian Empire. And he had a good chance, I think, of going back now that um, media Atropatine, so what is today roughly northwestern Iran, had become his ally. I think he had a good shot of conquering some territory from the Parthians, perhaps like later Roman Empire emperors. He might have made uh, what is today Iraqi Kurdistan part of the Roman Empire. But culturally, I think we would have seen the empire shift to the east. Uh, Greek would have become an even more important language than it already was in the Roman Empire. And the kind of politics, the kind of culture that would have emerged would be more like Byzantine culture and Byzantine politics than what we got, what we get in the Roman Empire uh, under Octavian. I'm not sure the Romans would have conquered Britain. Uh, I'm not sure they would have made their attempt, however abortive it was, to conquer Germany. I'm not sure how much they would have pushed to the Danube frontier. Um, Much more, they much more would have been interested in the East. And uh, we in the West today might be speaking languages that had more of a Greek base than a a Latin base. So I think our culture would be very different if, if the battle had gone the other way. I mean, this is like very much the chagrin, I guess, of my British and, and German listeners. But kind of what you're saying is, wouldn't have, it have been interesting then to focus more on the East, where you had established political entities, right, uh, from Egypt to the Persian Empire? Right. Instead of, of, forgive me for saying that, right, but then the backwaters of, of the British islands or, or everything north of the Rhine. Yeah, that's right. You know, um, the Romans might have got there eventually or, or maybe not. Um, but I think the, the Roman Empire would have been facing eastward in a way that, in a way that it never did, uh, and that would have had incalculable effects on on European history, Western history, and world history. And there is a there is a sense that something you also describe in the book, right? That Greek history and, and and Greek philosophy had a huge impact on on Rome and on, on the elite, on the Roman political class. Yeah. Um, and and I think in a recent interview, you also said that you increasingly look at Roman history more in the sense of Greco-Roman history. Could you kind of elaborate on this a little bit, kind of the, the, the time sure. of Greece and Rome? 
I think we underestimate the degree to which the Roman Empire was really a Greco-Roman Empire. And this became increasingly so uh, as the centuries passed. Um, if you ask ourselves, if you ask yourselves, for instance, what well, first of all, um, the wealth of the Roman world was always concentrated in the East, in the Eastern Mediterranean and North Africa and, and Egypt, and not in the West. As you said, the West was always the underdeveloped part of the Roman world, particularly um, places like Britain, Germany, what to say, the Netherlands, Belgium, um, northern parts of France. They were not the developed part of the Roman world. And culturally, Greek uh, was always um, very prominent, if not even dominant. So if you ask yourself today, what are the two best-selling books of the Roman Empire? I always ask my students this. The first is books that are written during the Roman Empire. The first is the New Testament, written in Greek. Um, and the second is the Meditations of Marcus Aurelius, also written in Greek. Uh, the Aeneid, Cicero, Caesar, they're way down there on the list of of books that people read. And I just don't think they had the, the cultural impact that those other books did. Uh, if you want to get a Latin that had that impact, we have to wait till you get Augustine uh, or uh, Jerome's translation of the, of the Bible. And they, of course, were Christians. And Christianity is a religion that develops in the East and is hugely influenced by, by Greek culture and by by Jewish culture. Uh, certainly Latin culture plays a part, but not nearly as big a part as those others do. Egyptian culture plays an important part as well. So I think in many, many ways, the, the Roman Empire is a Greco-Roman Empire. And wouldn't it be fair to say that even in, in Roman founding mythology, right, that it, it plays a huge role, right? I mean, they, they kind of trace it back to the Battle of Troy and and, uh, oh, yeah. and how this then leads to the founding. So this is almost kind of a deliberate attempt <laughs> to at least own parts of, of Trojan Greek history and integrate it in, the, in, the, in their own founding myths. So this seems something that the Romans are, are not, not necessarily have been shy about. No. Well, you know, we can never underestimate the importance of Greek culture in the ancient world. It really is dynamite. I think Victor Davis Hanson is the one who calls it dynamite or explosive. And I would have to agree. It is the single most influential culture of the ancient world and has a huge impact on, on other civilizations, including Roman civilization. And it, it comes back in a big way during the Roman Empire. And I think it would have done so even more so and earlier if the Battle of Actium had gone the other way. But there is something, and this is kind of, if we just for a second allow ourselves to kind of expand our view a little bit. Right. In, in when we compare, because you also write <laughs> a lot about Egypt, you write a lot about the East, which is, which is fascinating in its own respect, but it seems, and I wonder if this is a fair assessment, when we kind of take the, the traditional Egyptian approach to politics, even going back slightly further before Cleopatra, before uh, Alexander the Great. But right. I think the idea was that, that the state exists more or less as a, as a tool to glorify the pharaoh, right? The pharaoh is God, yes. and, and the state exists for its glorification. Like it, the pyramids, right. in a sense, they are, they are great, right? This does not diminish their, their amazing right. accomplishments, but they're right. all, all, all is created <laughs> to, to, uh, to glorify the pharaoh. Then I think yeah. in the Chinese case, we have the, the example whether the emperor does exist, but the Chinese emperor kind of is always then, then needed to protect the state. So, so in, the, in the Egyptian case, but the state serves the pharaoh. In the Chinese case, the emperor serves the state. But in the, the Greco-Roman case, it seems much more that there is this idea that those who are governed by the state should have a say in the state, right? They're not full-blown democracies. Our, our contemporary right. standards right. 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 our contemporary standards. But it seems that, that there is something unique. And since this was not planned, it's not supposed to be some kind of you know, Eurocentric cultural insensitivity. Right. But, but when right. we look at the great empires, there seems to be something different. I mean, do you think that's a fair assessment or, or is it kind of maybe a little bit too much kind of influenced by positive attitudes and positive bias towards the Greeks and the Romans? No, I think it's I think it's accurate. That's certainly what um, the Greek, one of the Greeks and Romans' great contributions to to history, um, the idea of citizenship and the idea that those who, who are citizens both have to serve the state in the military uh, and in politics, and, and 
but also should have a say in the state. That that's that's a basic uh, Greco-Roman Greco-Roman notion. So yeah, I don't think we should underestimate that. Of course, that becomes increased goes increasingly out the window in the Roman Empire, and by the time you get the late Empire. Uh, political figures uh, have very little, politics plays very little role, the state is militarized, uh, it's the emperor of the royal household, imperial household, and the military that are, have the major say. The Senate becomes increasingly a debating society. You might have seen that earlier. You know, you might have seen that earlier if uh, Antony and Cleopatra had won the Battle of Actium. This is right. I think it's correct me if I'm mistaken. I think it's, is it, I think not until Theodoric, right, and kind of the, the Gothic, more or less takeover of the Roman Empire, that the term king really is used again as a as an official title, right? It's it's it, this seems like something that they you can be a dictator, right? You can be a tyrant, but it seems they avoid at all costs to be called a king. This seems to be deeply ingrained. In true, Rome. true. But but by the time you get to Diocletian, they're calling the emperor uh, Dominus, Domine. They would address him. So um, not a king, but he was dressing more like a king. Uh, you to, to actually approach the emperor, you had to engage in something like court, uh, court uh, etiquette. Uh, the emperor had an Adventus ceremony, an Adventus ceremony to the city. It was becoming ever more royal, ever more monarchical. Um, and it, it became increasingly difficult to to engage in the fiction that Rome wasn't ruled by a king. One of the things that I also find very interesting when we kind of go back to the conflict between Octavian and Mark Antony is that what you mentioned on several occasions is that the Roman generals had a, a, a preference for legionaries that were recruited in Italy. And I found this yeah. quite, quite remarkable. Is this, um, what were the reasons for this? Is it because Italian legionaries kind of were more patriotic or kind of was that this, this almost modern notion of a Roman identity or were there other factors that, that seem to make them more reliable or more uh, it's, better true? It's, it's a good question. Uh, and actually I think we need more research into it, but uh, I don't think it was racist in the modern sense of the term. There was an element of racism or ethnocentrism in it, certainly. But I think also they felt that uh, Italians were culturally better suited for being legionaries. This idea of being these heavy armed infantrymen suited them in a way that it didn't suit people from the East or from Gaul, say, um, or from Germany who were used to fighting in looser, um, uh, more irregular, more individualistic uh, manners of fighting than, than in the disciplined, orderly uh, way of the Roman legions. I mean, the legions only worked because of their training. This is one of the things that we get from Caesar, and I think it's actually true. Um, so the Romans felt, you know, if you don't come from this society, it's going to be very difficult to train you to do that. Now, the empire shows that's really not true. That's absolutely not true. You can train all sorts of people to become Roman legionaries, uh, and you can reward them with citizenship after, after service. Um, in this period, there were Roman colonists, citizen colonists in the East, uh, and they and their sons and grandsons could provide legionaries. Uh, someone like Mark Antony would also just recruit non-Roman citizens and um, make them into honorary Romans, as it were, uh, for the sake of serving in his legions. But it's probably true that without growing up with this culture, it becomes more difficult to be a legionary, but it's also exaggerated. I mean, would it be fair to say that maybe the, the Roman understanding, to, to what extent it existed maybe more among the elites than the, the quote-unquote average Roman, that it's, it's more a, a cultural understanding of ethnicity, right? Nowadays, I think we're focused more when we talk about ethnicity in kind of, know, of a physiognomy, right? You know, those skin color, these kind of things. But in right. the Roman sense, that what made you Roman was kind of, that's interesting enough, seems almost more similar to the way that Chinese approached it, right? It's kind of, it's it's a, what do you see as your cultural heritage? What what language do you speak? And, and less whether you were born in, in, in right. Italy or, 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 or in Gaul or, or or, uh, or Spain, what are they Spain for that, for that matter? I think there's some truth to that. You know, I, I think in this period, the Romans are probably not quite there yet. I think they are very ethnocentric, very biased and bigoted, thinking that 
Romans are God's people, as it were. They wouldn't use that term, of course. And uh, Italians were second best and people who came from elsewhere were ridiculous um, and not to be taken as seriously and not they didn't have the right stuff. Although, remember, so in Caesar, in the, in the Gallic Wars, when his troops are going to face um, uh, Ariovistus and the Germans in a battle early in the Gallic War, Caesar has to say to his troops, don't be afraid of these guys. You know, I, I I know that they're big and strong, but don't be afraid of them. After all, we beat people like this in the Spartacus War. So um, there is maybe also a sense that uh, physically the Italians aren't always up to competing with the people who they oppose. Um, so I think it's complicated. I think it's probably complicated. It's a really good question. Really interesting question. I mean, is it? This kind of this touches a little bit upon this, but we kind of move more into the relationship between Rome, Greece, and Egypt. Right. This again, more for I'm, I'm asking this question more for dramatic effect. But yeah. Would it be fair to say that that Egypt kind of you know, the, or the eastern part was the wealthy part in a sense, right? In in yes. In, this is so, so. This is what kind of also historically, right? Kind of from the the the, the library of Alexandria, right? This this is really the, uh, in the Mediterranean, the cultural, economic, agricultural right. center. Right. And and Rome kind of is is only starting out, if you want, right? I think it's correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's the famous quote by Augustus, right? That he he inherited a city out of of, of bricks and then he left it as city right. of marble. Yes. But yeah. It's it reminds me a little bit. So that, that you had kind of the, the saturated East, if you want. And then you had the not yet as civilized, in a sense, almost maybe, quote unquote, compared to them, barbaric Romans, but they right. had confidence, right? They had energy. They were like, you know, they were new, they were young, but I guess as, as we would say nowadays, they wanted it more, right? So mm -hmm. yes, right, Greece had more longer history. So did the Egyptians, but the Romans were just bursting with energy, in, in, in a sense. And this, then on the long run, of course, seemed to serve to their advantage. They're, yeah, I agree. They're bursting with energy and they also have the military manpower and the traditions, the discipline, the order, the generalship uh, to to succeed. I mean, um, if we look at Egypt, they are the wealthiest country in uh, in the Roman Empire and uh, they have uh, Cleopatra is a huge treasury. They also have a very strong tradition of naval uh, ship building. And I have no doubt that Antony and Cleopatra's ships were better than, uh, te technically better than the ships that, that Octavian and Agrippa had at, had at Actium. Uh, but the quality of the technology and the money behind it are not the only factors for winning a war and not even the most important factors for, for winning a war. I mean, isn't that a little bit a lesson also for today? Right in, in a conflict, you know, you so say you look at GDP and you look at industrial output, you look at all these things. But again, if we take history as a, as a backdrop or as a teacher, it shows well that that is all important, but it might not be the only thing. It's not. It's definitely not the only thing. I mean, two other factors that are tremendously important are first of all, uh, a military's ability to carry out tactical tactics and operations, uh, and in addition to that, um, a culture's ability to street think strategically. That's tremendously important. Um, also, um, leadership is, is an enormous factor. And um, armies that have, nowadays we would say armies that have NCOs, that have a strong core of non-commissioned officers have a huge advantage. We're seeing it in Ukraine, for instance, where the Russians don't really have this. Um, and it, it hurts them it hurts them very badly. Uh, another historic example would be Great Britain, uh, which was rarely, if ever, number one with manpower, uh, but it had a tremendous culture, strategic culture and an ability to think strategically, to put together uh, money, long-term thinking, and naval strategies. That's tremendously important in, in, in the long term in, in, in fighting and winning wars. And I think what you're pointing at, sometimes it strikes me as, is it possible that, that not just in, in ancient history, but generally very often, we get the entire history of imperialism wrong, right? Sometimes I feel we talk about imperialism in a sense, you know, we have empires emerge and because they're empires, they are powerful. I'm increasingly wondering if it's not the other way around. Mm. They are powerful in the sense that you just described, right? They think strategically. 
they have, you know, they, they, they can plan, they can execute plans, and then right. they turn into empires. But not because then the empire makes them powerful, it is because they had these conditions in place that then, that then allowed them to build the empire in the, in the first place. But it's also more, it, the empire is almost a consequence, not a cause of their power. Yeah, no, I think that's 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 an excellent point. Uh, of course, history is a give and take, and you know, um, it's not either one or the other. But I don't think I think rarely, if ever, do empires emerge by accident. They emerge as uh, as a reflection of of the culture of 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 the people who want the empire, and also a reflection of the culture of the the object of the empire. So you know the. The great medieval uh, thinker Ibn Khaldun uh, talks about the cycle of civilization, and he says how civilizations um, grow powerful, successful, and then wealthy, and then decadent. Uh, and then you have new people who come in from out of the desert who, as you say, want it more. He talks about group feeling, the famous Abbasia, uh, and how that cohesion uh, is is the uh, the X factor that allows one society to to conquer, uh, to conquer another society. And, and so, yeah, I mean, if one of the difficulties is if you get two societies that both are at their peak and are, are both really want it, then you have a real problem. So Rome versus Carthage would be a classic example of that, where they both have huge strengths and it's not immediately apparent who's going to win and, and, and who's going to lose. I mean, I guess, at some point, of course, all of these cultural factors also kind of concentrate themselves in certain historical in historical figures. And of course, yeah. uh, the, the key persons in your in your most recent book, are the, one of the main one, of course, is, is Octavian, who later on the becomes known as the Emperor Augustus. Right. What do we know about him as a as a person, about his personality? I mean, what 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 made, was he a strong leader? And, and if so, what do you think would made him a strong leader? Or, or maybe his reputation is overblown. Oh no! I think he's a fantastically strong leader, uh, and he he's a strong leader uh, because of his remarkable personal qualities. He's not physically all that impressive. We know he's he's not particularly impressive, and he's not a coward. He fights, uh, but he's not a battlefield hero, and he's not a great commander either. He's not a great leader of men in in battle, but he is a remarkable strategist, um, an absolutely remarkable strategist. Uh, he's brilliant. He's ruthless. He's ambitious. He understands politics. He understands people. He understands war. Um, and he also has some knowledge of his own limitations, which is tremendously useful. Uh, of course, one of the reasons for his success, and it comes out very much in the story of Actium, is his collaboration with Marcus Agrippa, uh, his boyhood friend, who, unlike a uh, Octavian is a great commander. He is a battle, great battlefield leader, both on land and especially at sea. And the fact that Octavian knows that he needs to uh, defer to Agrippa on certain occasions, that's, that's so impressive and so important as a part of his success. Um, and that's one of the things that impressed me the most in, in this story. For instance, uh, we're told that on the eve of the Battle of Actium, uh, uh, you know, each side has uh, has a conference what to do. And Octavian comes up with a plan and he says, what we need, what we should do is allow Antony and Cleopatra to escape and then we'll deal with them later. We'll be able to take over the army they leave behind and we'll be sitting pretty. And Agrippa says, boss, that's a terrible idea. We really need to fight a battle. And Octavian says, you're right. That's what we'll do. Well, I don't know what I find more remarkable, either the fact that this happened and Octavian gave in to Agrippa, or the fact that Octavian allowed this story to be told. We know that our sources get their information from Augustus's memoirs, and I'm willing to bet that this story comes from Augustus's memoirs. The fact that Augustus would tell this story um, shows that he understood that to be successful, he didn't have to say, I'm the master of everything, that he understood that in certain times he had to um, he had to defer to his number two. And it was good for him to tell people that he deferred to number two from time to time. To me, that's a remarkable example of leadership. So he showed that he seems not to have had any problem with allowing remarkable people arise next to him. 
And it seems that these remarkable people also rarely, at least from what we know, challenged his leadership. So there seems to have been exactly the kind of relationship you would like to have at, at the top echelons of, of a state. At, at least sometimes. I mean, there were those who challenged him. He had another uh, general early in his career named uh, Rufus Salvidianus. Uh, he turned out to uh, be a traitor who was negotiating with Antony behind Octavian's back. And when Antony and Octavian have their rapprochement and uh, Antony marries Octavian's sister, uh, Antony also turns in Rufus and, and tells uh, Octavian what's happening. Uh, Octavian fires the guy and either Rufus uh, chooses to commit suicide or the Senate uh, orders his execution. It's not clear which, but yeah, uh, it's not entirely smooth sailing for Octavian. And he has to sometimes use the iron fist and get rid of people. Of course, his own daughter later on, Julia, challenges his rule and he has to punish her most severely. I mean, there's a story, I don't know, I don't know if the story is true, but supposedly at a point when, when Octavian was already Augustus and, was, and he was the emperor, he was invited to at some other member of the Roman elite for, for dinner. And one of the slaves of, of the, the, the host of the dinner party, I think he broke a plate or something. I don't re recall the details. And the host was apparently so upset about it that he, he sentenced to, to almost in a kind of James Bond villain style, you have a slave thrown into a, a, a pool of eels to be devoured by the eels. And apparently then, then Augustus told his slaves to break some things so kind of then to shame the host into not condemning the slave to, to, this, to this, what most certainly would have been uh, the, a form of death penalty. So I'm wondering, it seems that, that Octavian was not shy about using violence. And as, as you said, right, being ruthless, being brutal, but he, he, he never did it. This makes him such a Machiavellian figure in, in a, I would almost say, positive way. He didn't do it out of, of, of because he was a sadist, out of, out of enjoying it. But when it was politically a necessity, it seems he was willing to go to the most extreme ends. Yes, I mean, you know, as as Sir Ronald Syme argued long ago, uh, there's a real difference between the young Octavian and the mature Augustus. And the young Octavian is bloodthirsty. You know, he's responsible for the death of at least a hundred senators, uh, and he has he's utterly ruthless and and treacherous. Of course, he starts out by making an alliance with Cicero and convincing Cicero he's on his side. Um, he um, gets an army from the Senate and he uses it to defeat Mark Antony in Italy. Then Antony takes the remnant of his army and escapes to Gaul, turns around, gets new allies, comes back to Italy. And Octavian uh, then uh, turns on Cicero, makes an alliance with Mark Antony and agrees to the murder of Cicero. So that's the kind of guy he is. He's at least uh, as a young guy in particular, he's Machiavellian, he's ruthless, he's treacherous. He's like a character out of the prince. He reminds me of Cesare Borgia. Uh, but once he becomes the emperor, um, he is much more, uh, what's the word, magisterial, um, slow. Uh, he prefers to work behind the scenes rather than to, to kill people. Of course, at that by that point, he's made his point. He's engaged in a, a civil war, on and off civil war for nearly 15 years. Uh, that leads to uh, many, many thousands of, of deaths. And he's he's drenched in blood by the time he gets to uh, gets to be gets to the purple. I mean, it's just something that, again, that I think makes him such a striking figure. One of the things, I also, it's almost like a tiny sentence hidden in your book, but I found it so telling. When you say that Caesar was a conqueror, but not a builder. And a little bit, this reminded me of the conflict between earlier, before Caesar's time, of Marius and Sulla, right? Kind of where yeah. Marius had this successful general, but yeah. he didn't really know what to do in peacetime. I mean, I, again, I wouldn't take the, the comparison too right. far. Do you think that, would that also apply a little bit to Mark Antony? But you also once said that Mark Anthony was great at retreats and kind of <laughs> doing the, the offensive work. But do you think that that's also something that, that as you mentioned, the, the Octavian was not like the the, 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 the soldier kind of in charge. And he was probably right. more right, right. With Caesar, yeah. Mark and Tom, those were more like the military minds. But what would they have done or left if they would have lived longer as um, politicians? I guess I would have a slight, it's a really interesting uh, point. My take might be slightly different. I mean, Antony, 
one of his features is that he he comes up with this excellent diplomatic settlement of the eastern frontier. He sets up these client kingdoms, and he does such a good job of it that Augustus just takes it over. He doesn't really change much. He executes one or two people, but by and large, he leaves Antony's appointments in place. So uh, I think Antony's not without political skill. Uh, we can see it. We can see it there by his settlement in the east. And I think if he had won he might have done a pretty good job in what he set up in Rome. To my mind, what Antony lacks is he's not, he lacks Caesar's speed, agility, flexibility. Um, I'm trying to think of a different word than the one I've been using, but Caesar would never have sat on the West coast of Greece for six months and waited for his enemies to come. That's not Caesar. And um, he would have attacked Italy. He would have done something differently. Antony, at least by this point in his career, is passive. He's not worthy of Caesar. The reason why Octavian wins is that he does the Caesar move. Whether it was his idea or Agrippa's idea, he sends Agrippa and part of the fleet across the sea in the very early spring when conditions are a little bit iffy. Um, and they take Antony's main supply place at Methoni, and then they they launched this, this series of attacks, a series of raids to cut off Antony from supplies from the, from the east. And they never lose the initiative from that point on. That's not how Caesar, they're fighting the way Caesar fights. Antony isn't. So the one thing I'm sure about Antony is he lacks the ability to take the initiative, to take strategic risks in a way that Caesar did. He wanted a, a more of a sure thing. And that's why he loses, in my opinion. But isn't there another great, great, but another important lesson for contemporary politics that even if the odds seem to be stacked against you and in the favor of the of the other side, if you manage to keep the strategic initiative, if you're the one who acts and not the one who reacts, there is a chance that at the end of the conflict, you come out on top and not those who might have seemed more likely at the beginning to be the winners of the conflict. It's absolutely true. Of course, it depends on who your opponent is. Uh, but yes. Uh, and I think that's that's the lesson of Caesar. Here's somebody who takes strategic risks again and again and again. Of course, it's, in the end, it's one risk too many <laughs> by going to the Senate meeting. But but that's the way he is. And he is Caesar is a risk addict. I'm convinced of it. You know, he's he's a thrill seeker. He's someone who gets his thrills by pushing the envelope and going too far. Although he thinks about it, he doesn't just do it without without reacting. Uh, I think that Octavian has learned this from Caesar, and maybe part of it is his, who knows, even his genetic heritage. He's got that family cultural trait. But, but, but he also has learned from Caesar's mistakes. And so, you know, Oct one of Augustus's most famous lines is festina lente, or um, speuda bradeos. Uh, speeds and take it, uh, make haste slowly. Make haste. I live in Weile, as we would say in German. What's that? Eile mit Weile. It sounds interesting. Eile mit Weile. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Eile mit Weile. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, that reminds me of my I, my other favorite German term these days, Treppenwitz. Yeah. Oh, uh, the, the Geschichte. A Treppenwitz of history. Yeah, we don't have it in English, unfortunately. <laughs> But what do you I mean? As you know, so, so Mark Anthony seemed, as you just described, be capable in his own in his own ways. Octavian, we know, and of course, since since he was the winner, history tended to be written more in his in his favor. Yeah. But what what do you think was? And you described this in your book. But if you would summarize it, what led to the break between those two? Right? Like, why, why couldn't they? Were they two two dominant figures? Were their visions too different? But what led to kind of the, the fallout between two figures? That, that were always in an uneasy relationship, but that maybe could have shared power if, if things would have gone differently. Uh, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure they could have shared power. It seems to me the dynamic of Roman history at this by this point is that Rome's not big enough for two, two top dogs, and that it was almost inevitable that they would come to blows. Um, they had certainly had a history of distrust. They they, they make up, but they have this history of distrust. And when you look at the rivalries in Rome, Marius and Sulla, Caesar and Pompey, um, I think that the deck is stacked against cooperation between Antony and Octavian. Now, there are some historians who would say that's not true. Antony 
would have been happy to share the power with Octavian. I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. I think that that Antony, you know, Antony does what Romans were not supposed to do. He makes Egypt his personal possession. He gets control of Egypt. You know, the Romans had been worried about this for a century. They didn't want anyone to get any one Roman to get control of Egypt. But now he does have control of Egypt. And while Octavian calls himself Julius Caesar, Antony has Caesar's birth son, who everyone believes is Caesar's birth son, uh, Caesarian. And uh, he eventually plays the Caesarian card and, and acknowledges his legitimacy. He also, with Cleopatra, builds this magnificent fleet. And if I were Octavian, I'd say, so why are you building this fleet? You're not going to use it against the Parthians. What's the point of the fleet? <laughs> and if I were Octavian, I might think he's going to come after me as soon as he can. As soon as he's done with Parthia, he's going to come after me. So I think the odds are pretty bad that the two of them could ever really cooperate. At least that's how I see it. Since you mentioned Egypt, of course, we cannot uh, end this conversation without talking about Cleopatra, right? Yes. We still looms large in, in, in historical memory. So it, right. it, I think it's one of these historical figures, probably even more than Mark Antony and Augustus, to be honest. Definitely, people, yeah. People Definitely. The streets, right? People would say, do you know Cleopatra? People would say, ah, oh, that name, that rings a bell. Probably much yeah. like Octavian, probably almost nobody would. Yeah, would, that's would, right. Would, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so, sex, sex sells. Sex always sells. And Cleopatra is a sex symbol, and she used her charms to, as part of her uh, getting ahead. But by the same token, uh, she was clearly brilliant and, and immensely talented and ambitious and ruthless. She was a monarch. She was a queen. And uh, we're not doing her justice if we think of her only as Elizabeth Taylor or if we think of her only of the Cleopatra of Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra, as magnificent as that play is, and it surely is, um, there's another side to her. If we look at the coins of the mature Cleopatra, uh, she looks like Catherine the Great or Elizabeth the First. She doesn't look like a sex kitten. Uh, she looks like somebody who wants to be thought of as a queen, as a, as a monarch. And so um, I think that's what she was. If she had won, we would think of her as one of history's truly great monarchs. Uh, as it was, she achieved an awful lot. For somebody whose father was almost kicked off the throne and for somebody who had to fight um, internal disputes, murderous internal disputes with her siblings in order to become queen uh, and had to fight for her life more than once, she did really, really well. Almost how, conquered the Roman Empire. How was she perceived in Rome? You described this quite nicely within the camp of Mark Antony and kind of how it was a very, also a very contemporary issue, right? How how um, um, Octavian's propaganda, of course, also used this. But maybe describe to us a little bit. So, so what did the Romans or the Roman elites think about her, and how was it used in this in this political conflict? Well, they clearly don't like her. Um, she has a lot of. Uh, checks against her. First of all, she is a queen and the Romans are distrustful of monarchs. Uh, secondly, she is Egyptian. She's, she's certainly Greek or Macedonian in, 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 her, in her genetic heritage. She's possibly partly Egyptian. There's some question about the evidence, but it's conceivable that her mother or maybe her grandmother as well or her grandmother were Egyptian, but she's perceived as Egyptian. She's the queen of Egypt. Um, and uh, she's a foreigner. Um, so the Romans don't like all that. Uh, also, the fact she's been Caesar's mistress and she has a reasonable claim to say that she has Caesar's one surviving child, uh, Caesarian. So um, the Romans are very, very suspicious of her. There are others, though, who are charmed by her or impressed by her and maybe even who are bought by her. Uh, we She had all this wealth and we know that um, we know that she spread it around. Uh, so she was controversial. <laughs> I mean, the one, the one, because the interesting thing is, right, when, historically, when we look back and we think about Rome at, at this point in time, yeah. think that's me, maybe it's just me, but we already have the mental picture of the Roman Empire, which it really wasn't at that point, right? I mean, I mean, they, they, they were like, as you described before, right, there were, there were kind of 
uh, I guess would say like puppet states that yes yeah but there were still differences right to describe also there were like what is modern there Armenia there were kings there that were on right. on a market right. and decide and then right. they switch right. over. But yeah. none of these figures rises to the same prominence uh, as, as Cleopatra. So there, there, there seems to be really more than, than, than even in memory. I think that that that, that means sure. Lies. Yeah. Well, I mean, for I mean, um, of course we remember her because she's a woman, which makes her unusual. But just if she had been a man, if she'd been Cleopatra's, um, so uh, she uh, or Cleopatra, I don't know. Um, We'd remember her because of the wealth of Egypt, but also her ability to leverage her relationship uh, with these two great Romans, Julius Caesar and Mark Antony. Suppose they just had a personal alliance rather than an erotic one. Um, it's still really very, very impressive uh, what she does. Maybe in some ways it's analogous to what King Herod later does with his very close relationship with Augustus and with Agrippa uh, and the way that Herod leverages this to increase his power as a king and to try to ensure that his dynasty stays in place. He doesn't succeed with that, but it's not for want of trying on, on his part. And so Cleopatra is just immensely successful in her, in her ability to do this. And it's hard to avoid the conclusion that she is playing a big role in the strategy that Mark Antony comes up with. She really does seem to be his partner in various ways. Also, ideologically and in terms of propaganda, uh, she's a huge card for Antony to play. First of all, she's Caesar's mistress. And so by his connection to her, he has this connection to Julius Caesar, which is quite important. Uh, but also she's divine. She is meant to be the embodiment of Isis and Aphrodite on Earth. And by this point in Roman history, anyone who wants to be the first man in Rome uh, has a god who protects him. Octavian is, uh, uh, you know, the son of a god. Uh, he's the son of Julius Caesar. Uh, Antony, even before he meets Cleopatra, is calling himself Dionysus. And He's not the first ruler or the first major person in this period to identify himself with Dionysus. Dionysus is the god, of course, of wine, but he's also the god of liberation. And the ancients believed that he conquered Asia. Alexander the Great associated himself with Dionysus. And so did Cleopatra's father, Ptolemy Auletes, also, as he called himself the new Dionysus. So Anthony isn't choosing this at random. And when Cleopatra comes to Antony at Tarsus, she famously says, we're going to be this divine pair. Join up with me and we'll be Aphrodite and Dionysus. And we can also be Isis and Osiris. So from the point of view of propaganda and message in the East, um, it's a very potent combination. And Cleopatra is extremely clever in her communication strategy. And how was this, as you just described, so we have this divine idea of kind of the, 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 the rulers have this divine background. Yeah. How was that? How could they square that with the, with with Roman republicanism? That that at least in memory at that time must still have been around, right? That the battle at, at Philippi uh, is not that long ago. So 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 there, there there still must have been some remnant of the. Or let, if we really try from a modern point of view, right? in in modern times, you would say a republic can can you cannot square it with the idea of a, of a divine ruler. How did they manage? Well, it's a it's a good question, but you know I think that rulers are politicians are pretty good at being all things to all people. Um, Antony had his agents in Rome who were building temples uh, a la, in the traditional style of the Roman Republic, and they were doing it in the name of Mark Antony and celebrating triumphs in the name of uh, Mark Antony as well. And let's not forget that at least a third of the Roman Senate supports Antony in this war. They escape from Rome and they support Antony. Octavian, both because he's in Italy and he seems more heavy handed because he's in Italy, but also he doesn't appeal to a lot of senators because he's not really they from their point of view that say he's not really one of us. He is only partly a Roman aristocrat, a noble, and that only on his mother's side and his father's side. He comes from, we might say, the haute bourgeoisie. It's just not going to be that impressive to a Roman noble. Uh, Antony, on the other hand, comes purely from a Roman noble 
family. He's part of the nobilitas. Uh, and there are quite a few senators who prefer him. And then later on, when Octavian, the, when the war is on and Octavian leaves Italy with the fleet and goes to fight at Actium, he has to take the Senate with him. That's the, and in uh, prominent equestrians as well. That's very unusual to do that. And what it says to me is he doesn't trust these guys. He doesn't trust leaving them behind in Italy. So clearly there are plenty of people in Rome who say, yeah, we know what Antony's doing with Cleopatra, but we actually think we'll be better off with him in the end. Maybe because they think he'll be occupied with the East and he'll leave us alone. And maybe because they think that he's still a senator. Let's not forget that the person who abolishes the title of dictator after the Ides of March, it's not Octavian, it's not Cicero, it's Mark Antony. He's the guy who abolishes it. Um, and the reason the Senate was meeting on the Ides of March is because Mark Antony had some problems with the heavy handed way in which Caesar was governing. So he can, he can legitimately sell himself to some people by saying, you know, I really do care about the Roman Republic. We might know that that's ridiculous, but compared to Octavian, he might have looked pretty good. <laughs> I mean, in, in light of what you just said, and kind of returning for the last time to the, the, the outset of our, of our conversation, yeah, yeah. I mean, wouldn't it be, I mean, this sounds, it's purely fictional, but every time, right, when we when we open, a, you know, a map, you know, a, a world map, and, and this is changing a little bit now, but but usually what you kind of have, have, have like Western Europe front and center, right? Right, 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 right. Staring right at you. Uh, and I'm sometimes wondering, isn't that then, then also based on what you wrote? And I think it's very compelling. That's kind of almost a, you know, it's a, it's a, a, what, a um, like the, uh, an, an afterquake of that, right? I think it's always <laughs> fascinating how many things we still kind of, the world we live in, how much you can then trace back, exactly as you said. Let's assume it would have moved to Alexandria, right? Yeah. Let's assume that Rome would have directed itself then towards the east. The kind of that there would probably have been a split also geographically somewhere, but it seems fair to say that this is kind of where the beginning of this 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 split is, right? What would we now yeah. look at, at at Europe and that that kind of these these the, the seed was sown at, at at that point in time and it kind of is still with us today, even if if only subconsciously. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. You know, if things had gone differently, if we open an atlas today. Alexandria might be at the center. And instead of talking about eternal Rome, we might be talking about eternal Alexandria. I mean, history might have been, history might have been very different. So doesn't then reading your book and also the, the other books you've written, um, and what we want to do this a little bit careful, of course, but doesn't it to some extent settle the question, right? That this age old question, are there these great historical forces where individuals are just symptoms, but they can't really do anything? What does it really matter? Kind of do, <laughs> like, do the individuals really matter? But it seems, especially with ancient history, that we cannot detach it from those personalities, right? It, it's be, no. it's be interesting to say, no, no, things would have happened exactly the same way, and you know, Octavian would have lost. And, and so, so kind of the, 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 the great, uh, the Kantian forces of history were unstoppable. I think it seems more and more, no, no, this, this matters, right? The, the way they have this. Sure. I mean, I guess I would say that it's a it's a dialectic between the individual and the society. Um, you can't have you, if you're a historian, you can't study one without studying the other. But uh, I think that, of course, the pendulum has swung so far in the other direction and the emphasis is so much so much more, more, so much on heavily on society, on culture, on the things that social scientists look at that. I think we've underestimated the importance of individuals uh, in history, and, and individuals are tremendously important in history. I don't want to rule. I don't want to um, simply reduce history to that. History is more complicated. The real problems with the great man, or even the great man and woman, a great person theory of history, but you can't leave them out. You really can't leave them out. Do you think that that generally? I mean, I guess you would say yes, and I know that I would. We really should engage more again with these uh, with these figures, not just because they they really lived exciting lives. I mean, I can only I can only emphasize this again. I mean, reading kind of what you wrote from from whether it's about Hannibal or about about the the, the figures at Salamis now right. to but right. yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, this is really these are these are it's like you know Game of Thrones with <laughs> with less dragons, but otherwise the intrigue. <laughs> 
the, the personal relationships, right? That Mark Anthony marries the sister of, of, of Octavian. So it's all there, right? It, it's kind of sometimes we think, well, you don't have to make it up. As I said, it, you know, you can add some flavor if you have the, the, the kind of the, the fantasy element, but the intrigues, the political things, it's all there. And it seems in many ways, there is so much to be, to, again, history doesn't repeat itself, but there is so much to be learned in, in a sense, and particularly what you mentioned as kind of really as a concluding remark, but I find this so important also that as a leader, you must be capable, not just you can't do it all on your own. You need to find people kind of you can delegate to and that you can trust. Yeah, no, I I, I entirely agree. You no, know, I think that stories like this are are full of full of lessons. Uh, uh, and, and yes, certainly one of them is that leaders don't, no leader does it on his or her own. Uh, number twos are always incredibly important people. And your ability as a number one to listen to your number two is immensely important as well. There is some scholarship on the subject of number twos. And I, I think it's a fascinating one. I think we, we need more, more work on it. But I, I would just say also that as a historian, I, I'm not a believer in simply great man history. You really have to put the person in the context of the society and the society uh, influences things in, in many ways. You, you couldn't have had an, it would have been really difficult to have an Abraham Lincoln in, in Rome, somebody who's really born poor in a log cabin to have someone like that rise to, to, to the top. That's only going to happen in a, a democratic society and a relatively egalitarian uh, society. It's it's going to be much more rare in a place like Rome. And again, I think we underestimate the just complete and utter snobbiness of the of the Roman elite uh, because it's not so much a factor in our own society. So we've got to bring in the culture of the society and its parameters as well. But we don't want to leave the individual out. And I think as readers, we all love the personal story. We, we want to connect to the people we're studying. Uh, we don't want it to just be dry as dust. And so as a writer, I think the challenge for me uh, is to try to bring in the historical background while also focusing on individuals. And I think you did a commendable job. As I can't, I can't wait for the, for the next book. I mean, is anything planned or are you going to take a, a, a break for a while? No, I've got the next book planned. <laughs> oh, good, good. As I, it's, it's all, it's, uh, it's, all of them are, are again, tremendous to read, and uh, I can only highly recommend them. I think I have, and I look, I can now say I've read all of them. Uh, the Death of Caesar, I've read twice. So, so at this point, wow, I'm so my honored. No, I feel, that's so, so, so I, I like the, the other ones are great, but Caesar is he's such a fascinating person. I mean, this he's is, amazing. He really is amazing. You know, light and darkness. He's just yeah. Really, really extraordinary. And we wanted a conversation where you called him an evil genius. I think there's still, there's still, there's still. He really was an evil genius. Perfect. He was, you know, yeah. If there was anyone in antiquity I would have liked to have met, it would have been him, but uh, only at a distance. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> All right. Well, we are out of time. Thank you so much. This was, thank you, Ralph. This was a great conversation. Perfect.